Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm frozen and pixelated. That might be the case today, but um, <laughs> I think I'll, the lag will catch up at, at some point. Um, welcome to Isolation Break, Chapter 3. Uh, it's just a collaborative production between the New York Writers Workshop and uh, the Asia Pacific Writers and Translators and uh, YWW and APWT, um, both of which are, are extraordinary organizations that have kind of uh, international reach and that are uh, help writers from around the world. And I think this reading is a perfect example of that because we have five am amazing women writers from five different time zones. And so finding this uh, time where everyone could convene um, was kind of a, a stroke of luck. Uh, <laughs> but it's wonderful to have everyone here and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Over the course of the reading, you'll hear more about um, some of the initiatives from Asia Pacific Writers and Translators and the New York Writers Workshop. But um, I want to get started and hear all of this great work. Uh, I hope some of you will stick around for a little Q&A. Uh, and if you have any comments or questions as we are uh, ongoing, feel free to post them on Facebook and we should hopefully be able to, to see them and respond. Um, so thank you everyone. And thank you, Kavita, Sarah, Rochelle, Mags, and Usha, all for being here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Raji. Yes, and I, I know a few of you have new books uh, that have just been published or that are forthcoming. And so I hope you will definitely share with us uh, what those are and where we can get those titles. Um, so uh, our first reader today, is uh, Usha Akela, and she's authored four books of poetry, a chapbook, and scripted and produced a musical drama. Um, she earned her master's in creative writing from Cambridge University, and her poetry book, The Waiting, was published by the Sahit Kid Academy in 2019, and uh, also in Mexico in a beautiful bilingual edition translated by Elsa Cross. Um, she's been a creative ambassador for the city of Austin, and it's been included in the HarperCollins Indie Anthology of English Poets. And I think it would be remiss not to mention uh, her work uh, in activism and community. And she's co-founder of Matwala, which is an amazing uh, South Asian diaspora poets festival in the US. I've attended uh, a number of them and it is really a, a wonderful, diverse, nurturing group of really talented writers. Uh, it's dedicated to increasing the visibility of South Asian poets in the mainstream. And um, she has read all around the world, including at JL of Houston in Canada, Slovakia, Nicaragua, Colombia, Slovenia, and won such prizes, the Poetry Society of India 2019 Commendation Prize. Um, she, her work ranges from the feminist and activist to the spiritual and all things in between. And so this is a wonderful pleasure to have you with us, Usha. Welcome. Please, Thank, the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Ravi. It's so wonderful to be here and meet all, all of you, uh, all the women poets here. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, Ravi uh, for giving us uh, a bit of space to talk about uh, projects we're involved with. So I thought I'd read poems in relation to some of the projects I'm doing. And um, I'm in the middle of a very interesting project with a Romanian woman poet. Uh, her name is... Uh, Ruxandra Cicerno, and we're writing a book together where we send a poem to each other, we respond, and then the other poet responds and so on. So we're about 30 pages into this experiment. So I'm going to read a poem uh, that came out of that experience, and then we'll move on. I think you allowed us for three poems today, and I've kind of aligned them with the projects I'm involved with. So um, this is called, This Is That. You read me a poem in Romanian, Silouted in grey, stiff as a copse, in a voice aged by the sky. The light through the window is a shroud. I listened. A tree blooms, a tree blooms in me with leaves of nameless colours, of nameless terrors, like the nameless dead in Heart Island, the bodies of people dying in battlefields of hospitals waging war with their bodies in lonely wards. Is there a heart island in each of our souls to dispatch the unclaimed debris of our lives? Have we perfected the art of burial? I think, I think not. New lotuses rise from our underbelly. All is a recycled menu 
from the eons? Did I rise from my great grandfather and he from a tree, and the tree from his grandmother and she from a snail, and the snail from a fallen star or broken home or murdered race? Think about it. Don't scoff this poem. Is your laughter shooting from grief's trunk, and your suffering a page from eternity's laughter? Mm. So, so uh, that was kind of tying a bit with COVID, um, talking to people through a screen, and where you know uh, alternative kinds of communication are kind of slowly displacing what was considered normal. So that's uh, that poem. Um, my second poem, uh, I'm working, uh, I'm always, almost done wrapping up a manuscript of feminist and activist work. Uh, and this poem uh, is going to appear in an anthology of climate change, and it's called Adam Walking Backward. The season of certainties is past. The earth slips like an eel hard to grasp. Neither science comforts nor religion. There was a tiger, a gorilla, a leopard. There was a bird, there was man, there was a child. We will say soon this mess, this diurnal dirge of nature. This was a planet once. In the kaleidoscope shifts of the earth's destiny, too late we write poems, treat the earth as a rosary bead with sanctity. Too late, too late, we know this is the heartbeat, like caw caw in the sky as the Hawaiian crow call faded. The green recedes like a hairline, blue, blue is our future, and the rains come like an ominous doorbell, and the fire comes like a lion devouring, and the earth's despaired rumble in her belly. Under muted breath, Hindus mutter pralaya, a continent slips through an orifice. Glaciers slide innocently into the sea like a handshake. And we leave the seventh cause of climate change nameless. Arabian owl, Seychelles parakeet, New Zealand quail, ivory-billed woodpecker, skunk, duck, passenger pigeon. Where are the birds? The feathered glory of flight. Disappearing names knelled in the cave of history. Like arcane Sanskrit chants, we cremate ourselves species by species, piece by piece. This is Adam walking backward, taking his names back, giving the apple back to Eve. The lands shall be crisscrossed with a spider's web. So that's that. And... Um, Thank you. The, the last uh, poem, um, I'm, I'm just going to do um, little excerpts from it, like three bits of haikus. Uh, I'm involved in a wonderful project. Uh, we're doing a coffee table book on the city I come from, which is Hyderabad in South India. It's going to be an anthology of art, artists and poets from Hyderabad. So we're kind of in the middle of the project and um, I'm responsible for the poetry part of it. And Art for Causes um, uh, is a wonderful charity in Hyderabad and uh, they're commissioning the artists. So that's the, the project. Uh, it's a pretty long poem, but I've just extracted um, three haikus. So it's like a it's it's a long poem uh, with bits of uh, haiku like poems in it, about 30 of them. And I've extracted three of them. Ancient Haveli. You housed my skeletons and torn angel wings. You let me go like a dove. Two, where are the pan-tongued post boxes? Silent, they swallow no secrets and spit out no stories. Three, your streets like guzzle lines, repeating mournfully, return, return, return. Four, I will scatter my ashes over you someday. Cobweb of signs, city of my heart, receive me. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Usha. Thank you, Ravi. <laughs> Usha, would you tell us where can we get your books? The, uh, can we get the Spanish edition and also the, um, the one published in India here? 
Uh, yes, I do have copies, or so you can buy them in Delhi. If you want the Sahitya Academy edition, that's in Delhi. Um, my, uh, I'm hoping to receive more from the publisher in uh, Mexico, from Mantis Ed Ed Editoris, but I have a few copies on me. Uh, I also have the Rosary of Latitudes, and we're hoping by early next year, the Hyderabad anthology will be out, and maybe middle of next year, the Romanian collaboration. Uh, so th that's kind of the timeline a bit on everything. So Wonderful. We'll keep our eyes peeled for that. And uh, next up, and we were going to kind of bridge tonight um, from poetry into prose and then back again. And um, I'm very excited to have a uh, terrific poet and my uh, colleague on the management committee of Asia Pacific Writers and Translators, someone who could certainly speak to uh, the value of the, the conference and um, of the organization. Rochelle Potkar is the author of Four Degrees of Separation and Paper Asylum, which was shortlisted for the Tagore Literary Prize in 2020. Uh, her poetry film, which you can see online, Skirt, was showcased on the Shonda Rhimes Shonda Land, and her short story collection, Bombay Hangovers, is due soon. And you can follow her at rochellepotkar.com. So great pleasure to have you, Rochelle. Welcome. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you so much. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here with all of you and to share my writings. On behalf of APWT, we were looking forward to welcome you to Bangalore and Goa this year. But now we're waiting for 2021. I would read uh, two poems from my third unpublished uh, as yet book of poetry called The Inglorious Coins of the Counting House. When I think of war, this is what I think of. War specials. As we went to war over animals on our plates, pigeons too were seized by their wing flaps, rings around claws, a phone number and address with Shakargat and Narawal in Urdu. Spy pigeons, unbelieving of borders, photographed, carried messages, guided bombs, like knights wore horses that bit and kicked, and elephants that were machines. As we went to war over animals on our plates, animals were politicized too. Pigs squealing. Camels patrol, mules carrying supplies, oxen, artillery. Moose were trained not to be gun shy for deep snow cavalry. And dogs threw their weight or sniffed out mines. Monkeys dipped in oil and fire were thrown into enemy territory. When the seagulls flew, they carried torpedoes, dead rats, explosives in their bellies. Vultures, pelicans thrown to air, came back darkly and powderly. The new recruits were sharks with brain implants, cats controlling vermin, chickens detecting poison, bones and beaks in war memorials. It wasn't only Noah's dove that returned after the flood, Molotov cocktails. We haven't otherwise even left the bacteria, virus, fungi, embedded with heavy explosives, unseen beasts, second only to racial slurs. We now have words to reproduce in our bodies and ears. Time and time over our grand internet, staying in memory, trolled by embitter, embittered species. And words, they have a separate gallantry. Thank you. Or maybe when I think of war and its aftermath, or even resonant of the pandemic and standing up on your feet <clears throat> after it, I think of this poem called Ground Up. Once the haze lifted, the hot war had ended. Empires were lost and imperial powers thwarted. Many fled or were removed forcibly in the face of armies. Nationalist movements begun and forgetting was as important as the how-to of remembering. Schools didn't teach 
each history, and textbooks were blank. After the mist lifted, Trojan horses of Marxism and socialism galloped over the murky earth of capitalism. Some still believed they had fought on higher moral grounds. After the blur lifted, the dead were piles of rubble. Year zero had begun. Bridges, forests, vineyards were broom, and a diet of thousand calories with tulip bulbs. Babies were orphaned and women aborted, a million spoils of their wombs. After the veil lifted, on wobbly legs came the cavalrymen of cataclysm, famine, pestilence, but also microwaves, atomic weapons, power, penicillin. After the mizzen lifted, the Cold War had begun. Death three appeared to see how nations rose from their torn knees, wrecked ankles over a foxtrot of shards, catalogue of ashes, countries that had broken their tongues and ridges, and their people who admired and admitted that they were not the only victims. They too had raped and killed, drawn out the blood. Now textbooks have disturbed memories, not white and dark histories. The generations after bent low over their work, had 10 times at hand. They did not look up for years. At the beauty of the early slate skies or the late stone skies, but kept moving to stir, to sing, to rue, to sob, to stand, to cross, so to transition, to turn a page of history. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, moving on to prose, uh, I'm going to read uh, the shortest uh, prose piece uh, from my upcoming uh, book of short stories called Bombay Hangovers. It's a collection of 16 stories around characters living in the island city of Bombay across a section of caste, class, and religion. And this prose piece uh, yeah, is called Our Lovers. Back then in the 80s, I had just one lover. My beauty could afford only that much. Malaika's beauty afforded her many lovers. We lived as paying guests then, when jobs were scarce and the pay low, unlike now at these call centers where you get everything. Malaika was a charmer. At that time, a dinner was a grand outing and her boyfriends always took her out. She would come home and lay her gifts on the bed and we would talk about this and that, examining the gifts, toying with them in blissful trance. Sometimes she would get perfumes that smelled like heaven. Other times, books with lovey-dovey words in all its pages. Or greeting cards with pumped up hearts, silver jewelry, or ornate candle stands. One guy even had the cheek to gift her a polka dotted panty. We had laughed the whole night making silly jokes around it. The sex wasn't great, she said, compared to the precautions she needed to take and the anxiety she faced before each period. I went around with the one and only Glenn. He was a pious churchgoer and had a strong sense of marriage and family. He watched Sunday TV and preferred the parks, museums and seasides to the discotheques and movie halls. We would watch the waves jumped to our feet every Saturday as we sat at the beach side promenade, sucking onto our ice cream cones or watching the cars go by. There were ambassadors and fiats in those days. His gifts were nothing like polka dotted panties or blueberry scented makeup boxes, rather a favorite book that he had wanted me to read or a free pass to a science convention. He was a diploma engineer or something like that. We made love, though Glenn had told me that if I got pregnant, he wouldn't support an abortion. We would have to get married. Meanwhile, Malaika had moved out of her shared accommodation into a women's hostel, which she relayed, served delicious pork roast and mutton soup on Sundays. I would have followed her if it was not for the rent, which was too high. Besides, Glenn and I had decided to marry. Malaika came for a wedding. 
with a new man wrapped around her arm. Derek, tall, dark, with attractive eyes. But she dodged a question on marriage when I asked her. Malaika had many lovers, while I just one. But I dreamt of her lovers. Derek, Vishal, Bobby, Prem, Sylvester, Dilip, and Anil. Each time I made love to Glenn. It was my way of equaling the scores, besides having a secret harem of male lovers at my disposal. This was until I met Satyavati, our maid, and a runaway prostitute from the village, who told me how she dreamt of her beloved Jagmohan each time she was forced upon by various men. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Rochelle, did I drop Rochelle out of the, uh, oh, there, there we go. I dropped her out. So I just figured out how to have just the one reader on the screen um, instead of all of us. So I'm experimenting. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rochelle. That was wonderful. And that's from a, a collection you. of short stories you said that's coming out, right? <clears throat> yes, yes. Very um, shortly. Um, and I was just curious before we move on, would you mind telling us about this poetry film that you did? What was that about? Oh, yeah. Oh yes, so this was the Visible Poetry Project, the VPP, and uh, they uh, they kind of uh, match make filmmakers and poets and come up with poetry films. So this is a two minute poetry film made by uh, uh, Philippa Colley Cousins. Wow, great, and we can see that online, right? Yes, yes, yeah. and you would also see that on Shonda Land. Uh -huh. All right, wonderful. So um, next up, uh, we have another prose writer. Kavita Jindal is an award-winning writer whose work has appeared in anthologies and literary journals worldwide. She's been broadcast on BBC radio and European radio stations, and she's the author of the novel Manual for a Decent Life, which won the Bright Horse Press. Uh, it was just published in the US, so it's a new book in March of 2020, the UK edition uh, forthcoming on the 30th of June with Linen Press, so coming out this month. Uh, she's won the Foils Vintage Haruki Murakami Prize in 2012, and um, her poem uh, was included in 100 Great Indian Poems, published by Bloomsbury in 2018. And she's also the author of two poetry collections, Patna and A Rain Check Renewed, and the co-founder of the Whole Kahani Writers uh, Collective. And you can see her work at kavitajindal.com, it's a great pleasure to have you from the UK here. Kavita, welcome. Thank you, Ravi. Thanks for that. Hi, everyone. It's lovely to be with you. great women writers and Ravi and all of you who are um, joining us. So um, although I'm primarily a poet, today I'm going to um, read a very short excerpt from my new novel because Ravi kindly said, you know, talk about your book and talk about your latest publication. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. I'm very excited about it because this project, um, it's been 10 years from inception to publication, so I kind of do want to talk about it. But before I go there, I do want to say um, that is Patina. That, I don't know if you can see that. Um, that's my last poetry publication, and that was launched actually at Makwala in New York last year, and thanks to Usha, who was one of the organizers of that, and who kindly let me launch um, that on the first night of my father. So if you're interested in my poetry, it is available online and uh, well, the previous book too, but this is the latest. And the book I'm going to actually um, talk about um, now is a Manual for a Decent Life. I'm still figuring out where to put it, but this won the Bright Horse Prize in 2018 and it came out, um, as Ravi said, in March this year in America in this print edition. Um, I'm really excited that the UK edition is going to first be an ebook because I had a lot of readers in India saying they couldn't get hold of the book because the mail wasn't working, the postal system wasn't working. So the UK publishers are bringing out an ebook first, and that's in two days' time. Um, and um, the, about the book, I suppose it took 10 years. Um, I did a lot of research into it. It's set in the, at the turn of the century. That's the 
turn of last century, so in the 19, late 1990s. And uh, people have called it a political thriller. Uh, truly, I um, I'm, I don't mind what it's labeled. Um, you can also label it a romance because really it's a personal story of two people, two very different people, but the context is very much political and the backdrop and what they have to deal with is political. But I try to write, I hope it's a fun book, I hope it's an entertaining book that holds up a mirror to society, mainly Delhi society, I should say. The book is set in Delhi and um, in a made-up town for reasons of, uh, well, you know, a made-up town in Uttar Pradesh. Um, there's a large cast of supporting characters, which readers have enjoyed, I think, um, even though, you know, for Western readers, there are a lot of unusual names. But the two main characters telling the story from their very different perspectives are Wahida, who is a politician in the making, and Monish, who is, who is the man she's having an affair with, uh, he's the son of a wealthy industrialist. And both of them have to contend with the machinations of their family dynasties, um, as well as navigate the social conventions um, of the country. So uh, you can, as I say, buy the book print or digital, whatever your preference is. Um, and in the last few readings, I've been reading from the first chapter, just an excerpt from the first chapter, but that's now out as an excerpt online. I think um, it, it, an extract was published in a, in a literary journal. So for a change, I decided I'm going to go halfway into the book. And I'm reading from a section where Wahida has had to fight an election. So I've set the book in a time when we had in India, there were three elections in three years. So quite a tumultuous time in politics. And this is at the time of the second election in those three years, it's 1998. Um, and I think this bit happened in March, 1998. She's forced to take part because she's just set herself up as um, she's a rookie politician who set herself up as a potential candidate in a, a Nalkazim constituency. An election is called, she doesn't want to back down. She takes part, she's still quite an innocent in the ways of how things go. But, and she loses. Um, and when she goes to visit the polling booth, which is something she hasn't done before, she finds that, you know, across her constituency, uh, that half the polling booths are rigged either by this party or that party, the opposing parties, and her party is a tiny party. Um, so the main parties, wherever they have the power, they rig the booth, and obviously half the booths are not. But in her case, her party's case, they never can know how leg legitimately how many votes people actually cast for them, and they expect her to be finished. But um, she, this is you know, she thinks she would not duck down. They would find her resilient, ready to move on. If the other parties thought she was finished, they were wrong. Um, and it's been a long stretch since she, she's returned to her normal life because she was suddenly thrown into this campaign. So she goes to visit um, her lover after a stretch and we're in his head. So the book is actually a two-hander from two different perspectives. Manish heard the lift judder and stop at the floor below and her soft footfall on the stairs. He opened his door as she came up. He shut the door and let her drop her bag on a chair before he took her in his arms. Are you lost? Her voice quivered. He held her tighter. I'm a laughing stock, she said into his chest. He had never heard her sound so sad. Stop, let it go. You're with me now. He wrapped his long arms around her in a way that left no space between their bodies. Her face was squashed into his chest, her arms were snug around him, his knees were knocking into her thighs and he felt atoms transfer upwards from her breast to his. If he hadn't felt this for himself, he wouldn't have believed such a thing possible. He leant his neck to the side, resting it on the top of her head. Memories, not his, were crowding his mind. He closed his eyes. He didn't believe in the supernatural, but to prove him wrong, something was happening to him. His arms around her trembled. 
he could see her on the evening of the vote count. Chin strong, neck taut, no words, as she sat with her family circle, watching the results on television. Then he saw her in her room, kneeling on the floor, weeping. A glass dome enclosed the two of them as they stood in their tight embrace, and in it they were transported to a wild beach. Salt spray in his nostrils, crashing waves, huge, dangerous and unseen in the dark, their clothes tearing away in the wind. He opened his eyes and looked up. The sudden cross in the black sky. He opened his eyes and looked up. His off-white ceiling. The light diffusing from the queen shades on the central light fixture. They were just a man and a woman in a claustrophobic flat where all the drapes had been closed. They were a man and a woman who understood each other. They were a man and a woman who spoke the truth to each other, mostly. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Kavita. No, I was very quick, but I didn't want to take up too much time. I think that that is the intriguing uh, amount that makes us want to read. And uh, the intricacies of Indian politics that you explore are probably a little foreign to international readers, but um, mm -hmm. utterly fascinating. So thank you for that, Kavita. And uh, you said the book is now available in the US and UK, so you can get it anywhere. All right. Um, so next up, uh, we have a couple of readers left. Again, for those of you who are joining us, welcome to Isolation Break. Uh, this is the collaborative uh, reading series between the Asia Pacific Writers and Translators and the New York Writers Workshop. And um, next up, I'm very excited uh, to have Sarah F. Costa, who is a Portuguese poet, writer, and translator who has published five poetry collections in Portugal. Her last book won the International Award for Best Poetry Book Published in Portuguese-Speaking Countries in 2018. Uh, she studied at uh, Tianjin Foreign Studies University, and uh, her uh, work has been translated into several languages. Um, she's performed at the International Istanbul Poetry Festival, worked with Script Road Macau Literary Festival, and was invited to go to Ka uh, Kolkata to share her poetry in the second edition of Chair Poetry Evenings. And she also translates Chinese poetry into Portuguese and coordinates events for Spatoon Beijing based arts collective. And I hope we have time to talk about some of Sarah's work in China. And she recently launched an anthology of Chinese poetry she translated into Portuguese. And I'll just say that I discovered her work just very recently uh, helping co edit Meridian, which is the Drunken Boat Asia Pacific Writers and Translators anthology, due out later this year, around November. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And I have to say, I was really blown away uh, by Sarah's work, not having uh, really encountered it before. So I'm very excited to have you here, Sarah. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi, for having me. Uh, yes, yeah, so actually, regarding my last publication, um, I have it here. So it is a work uh, of translation of Chinese contemporary poetry into Portuguese. So it is not in English. I'm not reading from it, but it is my last publication. Um, I am, although reading something also related with China, uh, because I am going to read a poem that was actually selected by um, by Ravi <laughs> for uh, the Drunken Boat publication um, organized. Uh, in collaboration with Asia Pacific writers um, and translators. Uh, so I will start by reading that poem, which is called The Ear of the Pig. Can you just tell me which crimes are deep enough for us to build a shrine around it in our memories? Can we still dance inside a carbonized lung 
and a drunken scar. We're poisoning the roads, and there's red lipstick around my lack of perception. What is this ear's animal? Could we, we could just eat barbecue instead, make the pig go away with poetry. Why is it dragging itself to my menstruated voice? Is this just the air or am I breathing smoked flesh? Somebody told me I should enjoy the bacon between stanzas. Somehow the pig is growing, replacing the inner child. Now I have the inner pig. The IE painting my nails is asking, what is the ear in, in your country? Niman Tamaswan. I guess time can be part of sovereign power, supreme authority coming from the moon's rotation, just like my menstrual cycle. Always messing up with the ocean of nights that burst into mutual understanding. We all speak the same language anyway, but I guess the silence also requires translation. I ask you, quais são os crimes que nos permitem construir um templo dentro do coração? That's cultural adaptation. If you don't understand, I'll bring some ham. We have a feast. I'll throw in some validation. No dumplings inside the eternity of a memory because we have enough meat. And you bring the queen's blood in your shirt. How fashionable of you. No crimes are deep enough for us to build a shrine around it yet. Thank you. That was my first one. The second one that I am going to read is actually, I wrote it when I was pregnant. I have a um, five month baby. Um, and um, yeah, I was I was picturing as living in, in China, but I am in Portugal now and I can go back to China right now, but it's fine. All right, so uh, the title of this poem is Lessons About Jealousy. Speak loudly about surviving strategies so the child can hear it too. How genetic silver fingers can help you in times of confined days among other people's ambitions. We're just as strong as the repetition of the days we accept. You were playing with your friends and the little shoe blocked your passage. He thought he was a curtain. Well, if he was a curtain, would you still get mad? Come to the kitchen table before we get to know each other and don't get jealous we're much less foreigner than the man with the package at the door all right three poems so my third poem um is actually related with um the situation we're living in uh so the title is uh, pandemic Wash well the muscles of the poem. Disinfect the sun. Don't touch the face of the wind. Let the life warm up the sleeping child behind the mask. Keep a safe distance from fear. All right, and that's it from me. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful, Sarah. Thank you so much. And can you can you remind us again where can we find read more of your work and, and and encounter your publications? Okay, so you can find me um, on my website. It's uh, Sara F Costa, Sarah F Costa dot com. Okay, and uh, there's a, a section in English. I write mostly in Portuguese, um, but since I, I went to Beijing because I was uh, working in this um, Pitian Arts Collective, um, I had to translate a lot of my stuff. That was actually the first time I did it in 2018, uh, but uh, I was very happy that I actually was able to uh, translate my own poetry. I thought it would be a kind of a, a challenge, uh, but it's, it's kind of interesting to do it. 
Um, although the poems that were selected for the publication were all originally written in English. So I think that I must write in English when I want to write in English um, because it comes across a bit better. But anyway, as I have uh, five uh, poetry collections of uh, poetry collections in Portuguese, um, of course, I translate a lot of poems when when it's required for international events um yes and uh, i am hopeful that i can go back to china soon and uh, keep on working with speedtune arts collective we have uh, a website you can go it's speedtunecollective.com uh, in which we feature uh, authors um that uh, write can be fiction or poet or poetry um, we also organize a lot of events in Beijing uh, about reading nights, but also uh, some performances uh, with all the arts uh, like painting and music and uh, literature together. Um, yeah, so you can keep up with the events there and the, our official WeChat account. Uh, but I know that not many people have a WeChat, that that's a Chinese social media network, but you can also follow us there. Thank you, so much. Thank you so <laughs> much, Sarah. <clears throat> that was great. And um, now we have our final reading. And it's actually, I'm hoping when we open it up for discussion, we have a couple of translators on this panel. And I know Rochelle has a very interesting bilingual uh, book of translations that's coming out. And so I, I hope we can discuss some of that. But now we have our final poet of uh, the evening. And it's a bit cruel to have her on last because I think it's the latest in <laughs> the night for her. Uh, I think it's past 1 a.m., uh, but um, it's very exciting to have Mags Webster with us, and especially because her new book was just published, I believe. It just came out about a week or two ago. And so originally from the UK, Mags Webster is currently based in Western Australia, uh, living on uh, Wadjuku Bojar, the Noongar nation um, in Perth. And Mags' work has appeared in various anthologies and journals in Australia, Asia, and America. Her poetry book, The Weather of Tongues, uh, published by Sunline, won Australia's National Anne Elder Award for Best Debut Collection. And her next collection, Nothing to De Declare, has just been published by Puncher and Watman. She has an MFA in creative writing from City University of Hong Kong, uh, studied creative writing in, in Murdoch University, and has a BA in English and Drama from the University of Kent. And she's also in the final stages of a PhD in creative writing, which explores ways in which poetry can use uh, a pophasis to come closer to expressing the ineffable. And I, I hope that will be one of the strands of our conversation as well, is you know talking about the ineffable, talking about what can't be talked about is always a good thing, I think. So um, uh, it's with great pleasure and congratulations, Mags. Uh, glad to have you. Uh, welcome and thanks for staying up so late for us. It's a pleasure, it's my pleasure. Um, thank you, Ravi, uh, for bringing us all together tonight. It's um, it's a, an honor to be amongst such strong voices um, and uh, a, a real privilege. Um, I'm talking to you from um, Perth, which is uh, Wajak Buja of the Noongar Nation. So I acknowledge the traditional owners, um, past, present, and emerging. Um, on, on whose land I'm reading to you from. Uh, this is the book, Nothing to Declare. It's just come out. I've got three poems for you tonight. Um, and I guess um, what they all have in common is um, they're built around the sense of an encounter. The first one is called Hybrid. I am half flower half self. I grow a spathe to wrap you in a perfumed hood. My roots spread in your skin. My cells pulse xylem through your veins. You seek me like a bee. You bumble the ferment of my smell. But at the pollen stippled core, where spheres encrusted with soft stings, wait to latch onto your limbs. I hold you ripened. 
trap your cries like lace wings in my hair. Into my mouth falls night fruit, torn apart. It tastes of you, such tender inflorescence. Now you are the flower, and I the bee. Find I cannot lift my head. I lap the nectar at your gist and drown as your petals close. The next poem is a golden shovel poem. Ravi um, taught me how to write one of these. Um, it's after the poem by Gwendolyn Brooks, which is the poem We Real Cool. And it uses um, all of the words in Gwendolyn Brooks's poem come on the end of each line or, or words that um, you can identify as uh, the words that are in her poem come on the end of each line. Again, this is about another encounter, a very different type to what we've just heard. It's called Jesse from the Golden Shovel. It's dawn. Dirty light brings us into focus. The pit where we shared blood and skin dissolves into a bed again, sheds its surreal armor. Your shoulders pinch into the pillows, sheets that are cool at last again. Almost erased by sleep, I look at you in awe. The fading tan, the trace of last month's scars, the soft cleft at the base of your spine, the mouth which gave commands, was schoolmarm stern, then wavered as the night grew cruel. What were we in that dark? We're not those beings now. The mornings washed the lurk and shadow from the room. But I can still see bruises. They dilate like hungry flowers. This is the time of day I like. Before we humans grow a carapace, we're still naked and unshelled, yet to strike out of our night selves. It's when I'm likely to be truthful, and straight away you wake. Your eyes fill me. They track and bring me close up. We are unrehearsed. We don't know what to do. So we start kissing, kissing like we're being paid. Or I'm the mark and you're the irresistible assassin. How damned natural it feels. And yet I hardly know you. First time we hooked up, you left without telling me your name. Tall, blonde, too thin, you were my abyss. Did you know how much I'd crave you? How I'd begin to haunt the shovel, spinning out the gins as long as I dared? And how are we again, the barman milk would ask, as again I described you, down to the jazz tattoo on your back of your shin. That sounds like Jessie. Set she OD'd last June. Who are you, woman in my bed? One thing's for sure, you'll never owe me anything, not even your name. So what if you're really dead? We all die sometime, the cliche goes, and I'm on my way. I'll be there soon, real soon. And finally, I'll finish up with um, the title poem from Nothing to Declare. And it's, um, it's the, the title came from you know, when you go through um, customs in an airport, do you have something to declare? Do you have nothing to declare? And um, this, I guess, is probably quite a, 
you know, it's quite an apt poem to be reading at a time when we actually can't go through any customs whatsoever because most of our borders are changed. Um, but it's maybe also about something else as well. So nothing to declare. I thought I'd given up France for good, scoured the Gaulois from my tongue, but still I'm avid for absinthe. I am an addict who does not fight disease so much as battle with the cure. My name is, I fall in love with countries use men as their proxies. At night, I spread their bodies out tight, let rivers unravel, plateaus cramp, canyons open up like wounds. I may be exploring different skins, but underneath, their geographies are just the same. The compass needle lurches northwards every time. At first, I travelled in my sleep. Borders aren't patrolled in dreams. I flowed from Italy to Mexico, carrying my cravings like contraband. I dived down under, prized apart the hemispheres with my nomadic need. But it wasn't enough, waking alone on the blade of a cold equator. So I shrunk the world to a scarab track where I roll my lust like a ball of dung from dateline to horizons, change visas with a swivel of an eye, invade these realms a month or two, then deport myself, no forwarding address, not even a scrap of name tag stuck to the teeth of the carousel. Thank you. That's wonderful, Mags. Oh. <laughs> there you, you go. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So Mags. Um, and I know the book is um, published by Puncher and Watman. Is it available internationally? Yes, um, indeed. It's it's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Book Depository, so you can access it online via those channels. Great. Thank you all. Um, what a wonderful reading. Um, let's get a, a hand, and I know we can't hear it as we would in person, but for all five of these um, amazing women writers. And uh, I, I thought we might start. Um, oh, did someone drop out here. Um, I was so interested, Mags, uh, in, in this idea for your thesis, which must be close to culmination, I would imagine, but this idea yeah. of apophasis as related to silence, right? Which I, mm -hmm. I understand is kind of um, pretending to pass over something while really mentioning it, right? Like, I, I won't even mention how fucked up this country's response to the coronavirus has been. <laughs> for ah. uh, but so, how, how does this relate, relate to your... Uh, sense of silence? Well, actually, first of all, when you mention something by not mentioning it, um, you know, and saying that you're not mentioning it, it's actually, it's not quite apophasis. It's, um, it's more like paralipsis. Um, so apophasis is the, the rhetoric of negation. And uh, it, it's been used since classical times when writers, philosophers, poets, um, often, you know, not, not realizing that they're using it, but they, they wish to talk about something that basically can't be talked about um, because we don't know about it or it, it is beyond words in some way. So, um, uh, for example, it, it could be a lot of theologians 
used um, apophasis by to talk about God or, or a deity, and um, and it's it's said that the only perfect apophatic statement is actually silence, because um, when you are not saying something about something, you're still saying something about it. So. Um, in in my you know in my research recently, I've been exploring how I can take some of the um, principles of apophasis and apply them to a poetic use, uh, so that I can address um, uh, poems that are dealing or circulating around the, the topic of what cannot be said, and maybe use some principles of apophasis to try and. Um, play with ideas that that are to do with silence or to do with um extremity of of feeling when you know when when we're we're often pitched into a, a situation either either a, that we're experiencing firsthand or someone else is is telling us about and and we say well i i have no words for that i i don't know what to say and it's trying to sort of capture um some of that in that the moments when we most want to say something, perhaps when you know when language could be most useful to us, is often the time when language deserts us, and and that's what I've been trying to look at with my research. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> and um, we have here a question from Sanket Matra, um, which I'll just pose to everyone: uh, What does the future of world poetry look like when we cross the threshold of this pandemic? If anyone wants to jump in um, to take that, because all of all of you are really world poets, uh, and um, how has this all affected your your practice in your central community? Um, I can start, and everyone else can jump in. I think I don't think it will change very much because in the last fifteen years, um, poetry has exploded online, and now we are forced to speak to the it, you know, through through technology, and I think that is, that will continue to happen. Uh, I think it has made us reach out across borders in a different way. We can't communicate or meet the people we are we are geographically close to, which means we are open to to the wider world. So I I see it more of what's been happening really, but I don't know what the others on the panel think. So. Rochelle. Uh, well, um, um, I think because of the pandemic and it unified us in ways we would never think. You know, we, we knew that poetry unified us, uh, music unified us, but we didn't think a common grief like this could unify us. Uh, so I think there's a, there has been, you know, tectonic plate shifts in us individually, collectively. And I think it would come, uh, we would change, but we don't know how in our writings because we would see that, right? I mean, sometimes things take so long to assimilate and actually come out on paper. Mm -hmm. mm. Usha? I think uh, we are seeing the birth of uh, new hives of a different kind. Um, uh, we're finding new ways. I think we're incredibly adaptable. And poetry um, is something that will always find a way. It will always find a way to sustain and uh, keep alive. And um, we wouldn't have been doing this uh, if, if we didn't have the uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, I find myself uh, participating in more readings than I otherwise would have, where I have to physically travel somewhere. So um, uh, I think this has been good for the written word because it's also, I think, uh, because we're doing more of these online Zoom uh, kind of platforms, uh, there's a kind of resurrection of the spoken word again for poetry because we're just seeing more of this. Um, I'm hopeful. Uh, I don't think one can ever lose hope for poetry. It, it will never die. We'll find ways to keep flowing. And that's my faith as a poet. Mm. And, and of course, uh, what we're dealing with in some respects is the unknown and poetry is, um, significantly equipped to deal with that realm. Yes, absolutely. Um, yes. Uh, what do you, Sarah, I don't know if you heard the question. We were talking about the future of world poetry um, once we cross the threshold of the pandemic um, without mm -hmm. really knowing what that looks like. But uh, of course, Usha's point was great. I mean, this 
discussion we're having and this wonderful reading is uh, um, actually an embodiment of that response. It's kind of bringing us together from different parts of the world. And so there is a unifying force, but how do you feel about that? And of course you work uh, uh, between China and Portugal, uh, which is fascinating. Yes, yes. Um, I think that we are going to have like this global uh, collective trauma and uh, from all all traumas we can have great art so well this is a maybe twisted way of finding something interesting about all of this um but uh for me personally uh it does affect what i write but it does affect also what what i think uh, globally because i think i was used um to have um, a sort of freedom of circulation uh, that I just took as a guarantee, um, as the, uh, a guaranteed right. So um, this, I can see that, well, freedom of circulation like I used to have and that I maybe use and abuse um, traveling all around the world, coming back and forth from Portugal to China. Um, this is a way of um, facing uh, another circumstances and uh, understanding that it, it wasn't always like this. And uh, uh, also uh, attribute the kind of uh, importance to the things that we, the, the rights we think are guaranteed in a global world. Um, but anyway, yeah, I'm sure there's there's gonna be some new generation of writers that are going to write about this, and it's gonna be great. We already have a lot of literature about plagues and stuff, so um, you know, after Camus and um, even uh, Portuguese Saramago wrote something about um, a situation like this um, in his uh, blindness, in his book yeah. Blindness. Um, and uh, we will have a new perspective because now we are having this and we have internet as well. So of course it's gonna be a new approach. Um, and I'm hopeful that everyone is gonna get into working on the drama by writing and creating art. Yes, yes. Yeah. That Jose Salmago book, Blindness, is a, a really powerful people haven't read it. Mags, what do you think? I and mean, how has this been affecting you? Well, look, I mean, uh, I'm a pretty solitary person, so I'm just kind of, it's kind of life as normal in some ways for me. Um, and, I, and, you know, Australia's been incredibly fortunate that we haven't experienced the um, the, the extremity, uh, you know, of, of anxiety. Well, I mean, we've experienced the anxiety, but um, not not the level of uh, infections and, and problems that many other countries have. Um, I think, uh, actually, I think what might be really, really interesting um, is how people will read poetry going forward, because I've been really struck that I've um, come across poetry that's been written way before um, any of this has unfolded. And I have found it resonate in ways that it, it hadn't done before. It seems that um, so many themes that poets have always touched on are, are, are really prescient, are very, um, you know, they're, they're really fertile with the type of experience of strangeness and alienation and, um, you know, all, all of these unsettling things that are part of what we're going through at the moment. So I, I wonder whether actually poetry will have, um, you know, the possibility of a much more engaged readership um, mm. as well. Um, because maybe people will be, um, you know, it will be resonating with people in ways it hasn't quite done so before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've often thought, and in New York, of course, they have the poetry on the subway and um, in mass transit, and there's something very digestible about a lyric, small lyric poem that I would imagine could touch someone in this instantaneous way that... Um, you know, I, I think it's carving out the time and space. Um, but um, we have another question here, and I, I hope uh, you all can see these comments getting some praise. Mag, Varsha says, Mag, your work is astounding. 
and uh, Rocky Pants has uh, given a shout out to Rochelle. Um, but Tashana Singh has this question here. She says, I listened to Jane Hirschfield talking about poetry and practice recently and both being ways of permeating. The question is, uh, what do you do for your own poetry in order to keep its meditative nature alive in current times? So does anyone wanna take that question? I can go first. <laughs> no one's. Okay, please. Um, so actually, uh, one of the things I do is what Max is doing right now, which is staying awake at an odd hour. Um, <laughs> one of the things I do is to shut out the noise from the rest of the day and the rest of the while and people. And I can't do it every single day, but in the when because poetry is my first love. Poetry often comes to me at night as I'm sleeping and I have to wake up and write it down. And what I've started doing a bit more of is grasping those threads at night and not asking questions of them, grasping those threads, writing it down and going think, going back to whatever I found later to create, but in the space of that quiet when the noise of the world is shut down, you know, the computers are shut down, phones are shut down. So kind of where Mags is in this moment in time, um, that's, that's one way I return to something that, um, that I write with my subconscious to start with. It's not a conscious crafting. And then I move on. And that's how I save, I save that grasping what the world gives me in a quite, in a quite meditative moment. Hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, I think um, I have to reference both Mags and Kavita here. You know, like Mags, um, um, I, I, my normal is fairly solitary. Um, uh, I do stay at home. I'm a writer mostly uh, at home. Uh, so the, the definition of normal hasn't drastically changed for me. And um, I think it's probably even increased more. And what I found is uh, just during the COVID time, um, I find uh, the kind of stream of creativity has been going in multi directions um, with, with a variety of uh, things happening. And I have a routine of meditation that I do. And my hope is maybe some of that trying to get to silence spills over during the waking hours as well. And you bring it into your writing practice. Um, I think uh, there is that spillover a bit. Uh, it, it, uh, you don't have a meditative hour and then a waking hour. They're, they're kind of uh, two domains that do intersect through the day. And you can be in the in the utter rush of things and have a very quiet moment. Um, and you come, I come to my study and then I will, you know, do some writing and then go wash dishes or whatever. But they're intersecting worlds uh, that, that impinge upon each other. So um, I think that's how it works for me. Uh, so, Max, Rochelle, any of you have a thought about that? How do you cultivate that meditative space? I think um, uh, for me, it's, it's quite similar to how um, Usha was describing it. It's, um, you know, whether I'm, whether or not I'm at the desk or, you know, physically with the pen and the paper in my hand, I'm, I'm always thinking and, and working on it. Um, and I suppose, you know, my brain sort of settles into a, a you know, fairly quiet rhythm of its own. Um, it thrives on silence, um, I find. And um, I tend to feel that even when I am not aware that I'm, you know, I'm not physically writing, I'm, I'm still, it's the process is still going on at the back of my head somewhere you know, in, in my subconscious. And um, I never feel too far away from that kind of meditative state in a way. And, and I think reading also helps it a lot, actually. Um, if I um, disappear into a book for a little while, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm often in a slowed down state of mind. Um, and that's probably where some of it happens as well. Right. Uh, and actually, there is another, we have a couple other questions here. Maybe, uh, Sarah, you could take this one first. Now, where do you draw your inspiration and ideas from? 
and how do you feed and sustain your poultry when you're in lockdown? This is from Rocky mm. Khan. That, that's a good question. Actually, uh, what I believe is that uh, all experience can be transformed into poetry. So that's how I perceive my process. Um, it's based on things that I actually need to do. So I don't have this perspective of the poet that is always isolated at home. So uh, precisely, that's why this is a good question, because right now I am um, at home all the time, locked down. Uh, but also for me, this is a very special time, special in the good way and in, in the bad as well, because I am a mother for the first time and uh, all of that is already an identity shift. And then all the pandemic comes and actually it brings a lot of uh, issues for my circulation and traveling to China, back to China, back to my husband and my house and my work. Um, so, uh, for instance, um, the inspiration that I can get right now is actually from all of that. So it's everything that is piling on me, I just go and get the inspiration from there. Um, when I was in my last month of pregnancy, I wrote a whole book in like a poetry collection in two weeks, I think, because it just, it just came to me. Like, I believe in discipline and I believe that you, sh you must, uh, you know, sit down and write uh, uh, it doesn't matter how you feel that day, but you need to do it in, in order to have uh, work, of course, um, but to get some work done. But at the same time, I do feel some kind of <laughs> transcendent thing coming. And uh, I know it's not like transcendent, maybe spiritually, maybe just emotionally. Uh, I was in my last month of pregnancy and for me, it was my way of dealing with, with that, was to write something related with the moment that I was about to experience and that I had a lot of expectation and, and anxiety related with that. So mostly everything that I go through, I just put it to, into into words. I put it into poetry or or um, I, sometimes I like to write um, maybe fiction type, but my fiction is also very allegoric. So a lot of poetry in there as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so we draw inspiration is from everyday life, I think. Uh huh. Rochelle, I mean, the two questions really so, do overlap, yes, right? So. Yes, yes, they do, they do. And I think whenever the world gets absurd for me, which is almost every day, I would always run to the solace of uh, writing. And for me, writing is, um, you know, before publishing, it's my addiction and my therapy. So it's my rehab center as well and my addiction. But in this in this pandemic situation, the world became even more absurd. So, uh, uh, you know, I feel almost like um, poets and writers being these uh, well diggers. You know, we find the water first and then other people can drink. And we drink from their wells because uh, you, you are thirsty all the time because it's so <clears throat> absurd. But you're in the thirst for sense and meaning. And we're either digging wells or drinking from the other well. So that's the current thing going on. Uh, I, I thought uh, in the pandemic, I would be um, very shell-shocked and I wouldn't be able to write. That's what I thought. But uh, uh, I think just to um, just to keep myself afloat and collected, uh, I am actually writing every day like I would do otherwise. So nothing has changed in that sense. I think this is still a coping mechanism. Before the reader gets to anything, it's for me a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. That's good. The therapy and the addiction. I like that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we have a question from Deedle, Deedle Tomlinson, who says, uh, asks, uh, is there anything you're reading right now uh, while you're on shutdown that you would recommend? Is there any title of anything that has really spoken to you? Oh, I hear some kind of... Yeah, you know, feedback. feedback. Um, yeah, I, I'm uh, reading, uh, I finally got a bit of time, so I'm reading it very slowly, but uh, you know, I don't know if you've seen the book Girl, Woman, Other, which shared the Booker Prize um, um, with Margaret Atwood last year. Mm -hmm. That's by Bernadine Everisto, who, who I've been reading for a while, actually, and I was thrilled for her that she, I think she should have just got the book by herself, but I'm finally reading that book, yes, and I recommend it. Anyone else have any suggestions? Been, uh... oh. I don't know about, uh, 
Are you hearing that noise? Yeah. yeah. Let me, let me yeah. just okay. try to mute, mute the mics and see where it might be emanating. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, reading poetry, various poets, uh, a Colombian poet, Federico Diaz Granados, a Colombian poet, uh, very beautiful, uh, uh, highly suggestive poetry, uh, very inspired, very inspir inspiring. Uh, just read Dennis Maloney, uh, Karen Mir Miriam. Goldberg, uh, her memoir on surviving, surviving cancer. Sid Bose from the UK, I just read his Digital Monsoon. And Aman Haider, another UK poet. Uh, and and uh, Emily Dick Dickinson, just reading her again. <laughs> so that, that's where I am. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, oh, okay. <laughs> I am actually reading a lot of philosophy uh, these days because I feel like I need to reflect about so much stuff and it helps me a lot. So I read, I read Foucault, Punish and Discipline. I read um, The Plague by Camus. Uh, I read uh, Anna Arendt, Human Condition. Um, and now I'm reading a mix of Chinese classical philosophy. I, I just felt because this is actually is, is a, it's a bit of a difficult time for me. And uh, so I, I am with my baby all day. And then uh, at night I put him to sleep and I just have this sweet, sweet spot of uh, one, two hours in which I can do what I want. So uh, for calming me down, I don't know why, but reading philosophy is like what gets me like to calm down. <laughs> Um, okay, I can jump in. So I can tell you what I was reading in bed this morning, um, which was um, a book of poetry by Catherine Coles. She's um, Kate Coles. She's a professor of poetry at um, University of Utah. And she did a, um, a, a trip to the Antarctic uh, and wrote a book of poems uh, as a result of that experience, and it's it's an extraordinary collection, um, very very meditative, um, and also I uh, recently received a copy of Emergence magazine. Um, I don't know whether any of you have come across that. It's a, a magazine that um, deals with the intersection of sort of spirituality, uh, landscape, um, and writing and has some incredible um, writers and photographers and artists who all collaborate. And it's it's more often a digital platform, but um, it looks like they are producing every year an annual um, volume of the highlights and uh, in a, in a, um, a a hard form and uh, it's absolutely beautiful. I really recommend it. Um, and Emergence, they also um, regularly do newsletters. So I, I'm often in touch with what uh, what's being written there just through getting the newsletters in the email. Right. I might just uh, throw in, I've been um, reading the Jamaican American poet, Safia Sinclair his work, I think, is really quite astonishing. Uh, and um, I, I, I think uh, I've also been looking at a lot of different essays and the essay as a form. Um, so one other question I would be remiss, and I, I think we can have about 10 more minutes. And so if anyone else has a, a question, please uh, send it along. But um, when this reading was first announced, one of the comments that I was receiving was that how Oh, it's so great that you have five women writers, and it made me realize that it is still kind of a rarity to to have that. And of course, the landscape has shifted. And so, I just wanted to ask you all, as women um, and writers in this literary climate, is there anything that you felt or that you would like to discuss? Uh, 
It's interesting you got that reaction. I think writers should be writers um, regardless of gender, but you know, I, it's more, uh, <laughs> maybe others have more to say about it. I, I don't, I try not to discuss that being a woman because then that becomes about being a woman writer. I'd much rather just be a writer, a poet, a novelist, you know, one of those things without it, um, without it being gender specific. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I think I've been very in involved with women's issues right now. And uh, it has something to do with the manuscript I just wrapped up. Uh, I've been looking at women, women's issues around the world. And my poems talk about uh, dow dowry, FGM, foot, bind foot binding, and, and so on. And, and a lot of activist issues. So, uh, I, I think being a woman has been very heightened, heightened unlike Kavita's stance right right now. <laughs> no, I, I actually, for, I'm as with you on all those issues. I just, um, I, I mean, you write about it and I write about it in my work, but I don't want to be just a woman writer. I suppose that's what I was saying. But it's yeah. a different way of um, being public, publicly, I think. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Sarah, I think you had something to say? Yeah, um, I think that in this time of crisis, it is it, really nice to see diversity in terms of more women being represented in a lot of uh, um, circumstances, like writers, but also uh, in arts, but uh, politics as well. So we can see that in Europe, we have um, a lot of female prime ministers of countries, and uh, they are dealing with the a pandemic uh, the, in the best way. So uh, I'm really glad to see that happening. And um, I hope that they keep up with the good work. Um, and it's it's just great to see more women taking uh, leadership. Yeah. Rochelle, I mean, you're, of course, um, talking to us from India, where there's a, a completely different climate and atmosphere. What? Uh, how's it going? Uh, well, so, you know, I would agree with Kavita. Uh, so while I write uh, about women, you know, and in my poetry or have women characters, but I do have all kinds of characters, not just women. Uh, so I think once you, you, you know, you stop hearing this comment about all women or women, we'll move, we'll shift the paradigm a bit to then LGBTQI, trans women, you know, there is, we, we'll be done with the novelty of women or like, you know, even talking about all women here, it would be normal <laughs> if it's not. It, it, the balances are still to still to tip, right? They're still slightly imbalanced. That's right. Yes, then the one would hope the same would hold through true for race and sexuality yes. and, and the whole gamut, mm -hmm. right? As, as we and even evolve. even uh, inequities of all kinds, class, social. Yeah. Uh huh. It's nice. a long way, long way. To yeah, I guess I, um, I mean, something Rochelle just said, uh, how um, writing enables us to inhabit so many different personas. Um, and that's certainly true. Um, when I write poetry, I, um, you know, I, I don't think of it as being a woman's voice, particularly. Um, I uh yeah i i don't I, I mean there are a lot of things um that make me very um vocal um and and ab about the condition of being a woman in in many other areas but i suppose in my own writing practice i just don't feel it's yeah it, it's not something i've really considered greatly um and I, I i don't i suppose i don't really write political poems in that sense and yet I, I, you know i have um come across and and i do have a lot of sympathy um with you know the observation that even to write is a political act so i i guess i haven't thought about it deeply enough and and i could probably do with thinking about it a lot more hmm. All right, um, we have here, uh, and, and maybe uh, 
we'll make this the last comment and then we'll have uh, a last question and then give you all a chance to leave us with something. But this is from Tim Tomlinson, a bit of a provocative question, but a good one. Uh, would the woman be inter Would you all be interested in a discussion, panel discussion of all men writers? Yes, they're all yeah. human beings. Like we're all human beings. Yeah, and absolutely. Coming back to the women's <laughs> question and activism, I'm a campaigner for the right to abortion, but it shouldn't be just women campaigning for that. Or that panel of all men should also be on there doing it. So, yes, yes, Tim, I would come when it's just you and five men. That's fine. <laughs> I would love well, that. <laughs> but but do you feel, I mean, in this area of um, the necessity of diversity and representation, if you were to pitch something like that, it probably would get some pushback, right? I mean, how about the rest of you? How do you feel? Of course, all as human beings and as writers, there would be a lot to, to say, but does that paradigm seem somehow dated or something? I don't think yes. it's dated yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think our eyebrow would go off. <laughs> yeah, Sarah, what do you? Yeah, I think it's a bit dated, but it's still happening at the same time. So it's still actual. Um, yeah, I like to see more women represented. I mean, especially in politics, it's like they need to be there. I'm not saying that it's better or worse. It's just like, let's have diversity you know and uh, yeah i i would go to see what the panel discussion uh, only with men that happens all the time and i i go uh because i want to know stuff from people in general uh <laughs> but i think that a female presence is essential nowadays yeah <laughs> tim says he's we're thinking of launching testosterone tuesdays stay tuned yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, more balanced. More yeah, uh, you know, and I mean, I think that it's really policy changes that need to speak to these kind of institutional sexism, right? I mean, the wage gap that happens, and um, certainly, I mean, there's this awakening moment in the U.S. with what's happening with police brutality, but it's not new news in any respect. And you just need to look at the statistics of uh, who is arrested and incarcerated, and look at the kind of the economic disparity between racist to see what's what's happening and i think a lot of times we um the work that it takes and we it's one thing to be aware of it and uh to say isn't that too bad but to actually do the work that it takes to dismantle those systems i think uh you know requires political work as sarah was saying yeah. actually i'm going to jump in Ravi, and say exactly so thank you first of all the perception of the whoever in the audience had women writers and thank you to you for putting on five women writers because tim as tim said would you go to the panel as sarah said Yes, you would, because most of the time it is like that. So, but it shouldn't be such a surprise when it's uh, you are hosting five of us. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. Exactly. It shouldn't be, and you know, it's entirely up to the people who want to make a big deal of it and those who don't. But we do need people to do it. So, thank you, Ravi. That's exactly as you said. Yeah. is required. <laughs> well, and to your point, Kavita, it wasn't conscious in any way. I was like, this will be a great collection of writers. So. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's the writing, the quality of the writing is is also what has to count as well. So yes. nobody yes. nobody wants to be the token. Mm -hmm. right. mm. Yes, that's right. That's all right. Um, so maybe we can end. Thank you all so much. Again, this is Isolation Break, a uh, joint production of uh, Asia Pacific Writers and Translators and the New York Writers Workshop. And maybe um, each of you can end with uh, just a little statement your fortune cookie at the end of this great meal. Um, what would you leave us with? Uh, something to think about, something you're thinking about, or uh, some project you're working on, whatever you like. Well, I'm thinking about going to bed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. way to go. <laughs> I, I'm thinking of lunch. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are some writers, I think, uh, listening in and asking those great questions. And I would say, never give up. Through mm. pandemic, a long pandemic, <laughs> keep going, never give up with whatever you're doing. Yeah, I would say thank you uh, for giving us this opportunity of being here together from different time zones. Uh, I, it's not even countries, it's like time zones. Uh, yeah. So. It is, it is incredible and um, it is an opportunity for this 
uh, cross culture activity to happen and thank you so much for yeah. for allowing it to happen yeah it's great and i, I mean I would, I, would, i would also yeah i would like to thank uh, thank ravi for this and i would like yes, to thank absolutely. all the all the commentators and also the people who would all the people on the panel here and the people who would view us because i'm just thinking if the pandemic or the virus was transcending boundaries so is technology so mm. uh, what would we mm. have done if we didn't have the internet and we had the virus Yes. Yeah, I thought to that <laughs> that too. <laughs> At least we have technology transcending as well. So. Yes, and yeah. a lot of comments yeah. coming in. Uh, everyone is very appreciative. Thank you all so much and to those of you, you who are watching, I encourage you to to buy the books of these writers and to support uh publishers during this pandemic. Um I'm Ravi mm -hmm. Shankar. This has been Isolation Break. I uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thanks everyone.